words. Religion and philosophy on a Friday afternoon, guys. Um, this is going to move us beyond the river valley civilizations. And these are themes that are going to run through the entire rest of um, world history. We're going to talk about Confucianism and legalism and Hinduism and Buddhism. Come on in. And the thing to remember is that all of these begin in or near river valley civilizations. Second thing to remember is that um, they will um, be breakthroughs and they will last for quite a long time. And they are foundational. And by that, I simply mean there will be things added on to them. They will, be, they will evolve, but the roots stay in the original framework, like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And these ideas will literally spread globally through trade, through migration, and even warfare, especially along the Silk Road, and even the Columbian Exchange, the transatlantic trade with missionaries going to the New World. And each was designed to solve a crisis as old methods will no longer work. Um, what was happening just doesn't matter anymore. There's got to be a next step. Is everybody good for me to continue? Great. Okay, right. All right. So here we are, Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, and China. We're going to backtrack and start in China, move over to India, go to Mesopotamia, and wind up here in ancient Greece. Before I forget, um, both China and India and Japan, everything is uploaded on the YouTubes if you need it this weekend. In China, we have that Warring States era that we talked about earlier in the week. And what may um, help out sometimes to stop chaos is order, like hardcore um, militaristic order. And the Zhao dynasty has ended in chaos, and this is going to bring up the new, what is known as Qin dynasty, if that will help you tell us. And the Qin dynasty, remember, you take it on the uh, Qin. They will practice the governing philosophy of legalism. And legalism believes that a strong country must be united. We must all do the same thing at the same time. And the emperor burned all the books of learning and philosophy that he did not agree with. And he says that we can't listen to the dynastic past, right? The Shang Dynasty can't help us. The Zhao or Chao can't help us. This is something completely new. And the problem is humans are driven by greed. So if that is the case, then you must be richly rewarded when you do something well, and you must be brutally and savagely punished when you do something incorrect. This, he felt, would strengthen China. And laws are swift, they are violent, and they are impartial. Man, woman, young, old, rich, poor, it really doesn't matter. And all this is brought up by Emperor Shi Wangdi, who will unify China, and he will increase the agricultural yield. He will join the Great Wall of China together and unify the writing system. However, everything happens so fast. People need time to get accustomed to a change. And it was overnight. People were so tense. They didn't know if anything they were going to do would get them in trouble. Plus, to pay for a lot of this, he has to charge ridiculously high taxes. And so his, remember I told you it's, you know, Darth Vader with the power of the Death Star. I hold the power of this... Um, uh, a star system in my fingers and Princess Leia says, well, yes, but the tighter you squeeze, the more star systems slip through your fingers. Well, it quickly leads to his overthrow. Being uniform and being rigid is okay, 
but you can't maintain that. Once you get order, you got to back off and just kind of let people be. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So, um, so he does build the terracotta warriors. They're cool, and the Great Wall, which is also very cool. And one of the works of, of literature that he does not destroy is by one of my favorites, good old Confucius. Confucius wanted to be a political advisor, but he had the horrible habit of always telling the truth. And a lot of times, big businessmen, political leaders, don't want people to say no. They want yes men. Yes, Your Highness, that's a great idea. Yes, Mr. President, that's a great idea. Right, CFO, CEO, that is a great um, uh, idea. And when he keeps getting fired, Confucius says, well, if I can't influence people by being a political advisor, I know what I'll do. Probably the worst idea he ever had. He said, I will become a teacher. God, that was stupid. But he's a smart guy. And... His students will write down everything he says in a collection of works known as the Analects. And what, what um, the beauty of what Confucius does is he says the commoners, peasants, don't understand moral action. But truly noble people do. You're not noble from birth, all right? Lord Gershon... All right, he may have earned that title, but his son, what did Lord Gershon Jr. do? Nothing except be born. So noble isn't your last name. It's not a birthright. It's how you behave. And Confucius says, this is really nothing new. I, I'm a transmitter of um, tradition. This just makes sense. And so he writes down little sayings like many hands make light work. If we all do what we're supposed to do, right, things are going to run well. If we come to class, if we do um, our uh, assignments on time, if the bros run box, whatever that is, the way they're supposed to, and they trust the system, well, things will go fine. Um, Poppy, have you scored lately? Yes, why? Because you did what you were. Screw me, Poppy. Poor Poppy. Even though just go with the poppy, all right? So anyway, he says, I'm just telling you what's always been there. I'm telling you a new way to look at it. And he said, if we study the dynastic cycle, and it's Confucius that gives the mandate of heaven validity, look at what they did at the top of the Shang dynasty and the top of the Zhao Chao dynasty. That's what we want. When you rolled up his sleeves, went out there and dug those ditches, that's what we want. We must return to those ways. And he goes, so to help out, I'm going to create this thing called filial piety. It is an unbroken chain where everybody has to do their role. If you just do your role and everybody does what they're supposed to do, we're going to be just fine. <coughs> it's ruler to subject, father to son, older brother to younger brother, husband to wife, and friend to friend. Everybody has two responsibilities except the emperor. One is the superior role, which you must teach and help. The other one is the inferior role, where you're supposed to listen and learn. And what he says is to get society, society to work well, is if you do your role, the truly nobles will know the right thing to do. A new student moves into school. Poor Alexei... Um, drops her notebook all over. Do we sit and laugh at Alexi, or what do we do? Hey, Alexi, can we help you put everything back um, together? Thomas Biles is running up the stairs on a wet, rainy uh, Monday morning to get to AP World History. He slips and falls, and his project for civics and economics goes haywire. And what do most people do? Point and laugh. What do we do in first and third period? Hey, Thomas, are you okay, man? Let's pick all of that up. The only person laughing at him is probably Kamada. All right. 
do the right thing on a grace, not the popular thing. So anyway, that's what will help out China. And it is he who comes up with the, writes down the different stages. Strong emperor doing good. Over time, the kids get lazier and lazier and lazier. Till the bottom, where they are, the, they're so greedy, so evil, they're the complete opposite of their ancestors. The gods must take away their um, power to rule. Everybody must be punished. And the whole thing starts all over again. My chart is much better, but I couldn't find it, so there's that. So I can... All right. Here's my favorite, peasants. Straw dogs, I should say. Taoism. Taoism is this unnatural, unseen thing like the force. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't smell it. But it's always there. It's the governing thing of the entire world. And in China, heaven and earth aren't two planes. There's not heaven and earth. They are on the same single plane. And they're cruel. Life is hard. Life is going to beat you down. Nothing is easy. You have to work for it. Life treats you like a straw dog, like a miserable mangy mutt that is so worthless. If it's not there, nobody, nobody notices. Nobody cares. And Taoists don't like knowledge. Because when you acquire knowledge, you learn about disparity. Richer or poorer. You know, pretty ugly. Not pretty ugly, but one person is pretty, the other person is ugly. You are fat, you are skinny. You have a nice house, you live in Eeyore's collection of sticks out in the woods somewhere. We don't want to acknowledge distinctions. So a sage king, a sage king is the perfect ruler. Because he or she is going to stand there and they're going to look at their miserable peasants who are going, please... Help! Please help! And the instinct is to run right down there, right? When Zach was a little shaver, his mom put and dad put training wheels on his little bike, and they pushed him down the sidewalk, and they made sure he could pedal and turn, and then they took the training wheels off, and Zach fell over and skinned his knee and cried and wailed. And if mom and dad would have ran down there and picked Zach up, what would have happened? Zach would never have been able to ride his bike. And now, Zach, what did you do yesterday? I rode with the mountain biking team from the high schools to Alfredo's and then back. And you did it on your own, right? Did anybody help you? Yeah. No. So it's the old, give a man to fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. If we all rush down and help Zach get back on his bike, he's always going to expect us to be there. Mr. Mullane, can you write your thesis, my thesis statement for me? Can you help me write my body paragraph? Mr. Mullane, where do I put my name on my paper? Well, if I did it for you guys, come May 17th, you would be in a lot of trouble. But we want a PC. This is a G-rated lesson for the most part, all right? Sometimes you got, and it sucks to watch people struggle, but that will only make you better. What do they say in Sparta? That which does not kill me only makes me stronger. So go ahead and struggle with it. So the perfect government would stand there and let you struggle until you learned how to do it yourself. All three of those things were different ideas to help combat um, the period of chaos in China. Confucianism wins out. Confucianism makes the most sense. And whenever China gets itself into trouble, they always say, what would Confucius do? If we move down the Silk Road, south and west down the Silk Road, we come to India. And in India, for the last 1,000 years, there has been this Vedic age, where the Vedas, these collection of hymns and prayers, are written out. And 
Um, it's a magical approach. There's a lot of ritual and sacrifice. And the problem is only the wealthy can afford this. If you're a poor person, there's really nothing that you can do. You can't sacrifice your chicken or your eggs because you need them to survive. And finally, a new Veda, a new book comes along, and it's said that an individual can acquire Brahman. Now, Brahman is the top of the ladder. It is the force for our intense purposes that, like Luke and Obi-Wan, and whoever these new Star Wars characters are, I don't really know them. Brahman is up here. It is the spiritual force that combines all living things in the universe together. Underneath it is heaven and the gods. And on the third plane is the earth. You are trying to climb the ladder from earth to heaven to achieve union with Brahman. And the new Veda says you don't need elaborate rituals. You don't need dances and music and sacrifice and incense. You can get to Brahman through mental action alone. And this is brought up by a group called the Upanishads. And they said what you have to understand is nothing is permanent. Life is always in flux. Success, failure, health, Sickness, age, beauty, they're always changing. And so some people say, well, I could do a bunch of good deeds, right? I could build up a surplus of good deeds, and then I can slack off. I've done ten good things, so now I can do two or three bad ones, and I'm plus seven or eight. Panishad says, no, you've got to think about every single thing that you do. The ritual is not important. It's what you are trying to accomplish with that ritual. So like saying a prayer a thousand times is not as good as saying one really good prayer one time. Why well, keep saying it? Right? So, and part of this becomes up of a Hindu idea of the transmigration or the samsara. Where every individual is going to live and die and be reborn many times. You're going to live a life, you're going to die, you're going to live another one. And you're trying to climb the ladder to Brahman every time. So you guys would really like this in the modern narcissistic age because you can focus only on yourself. You can like take selfies and, <clears throat> and do all this stuff. Oh, look at me, I'm in Washington. Look at me, I'm in front of the pyramids. I'm like, I don't care about you. Show me the pyramids. I don't care about any other nonsense. All right? Focus only on yourself. And you got to understand that Hinduism is liberating yet burdensome. Right? If you're born in a low caste, you are responsible for being there. Your own actions. So you know sooner or later, man, this caste sucks. Oh, God, hope you know life is over soon, and so you know it's going to come to an end. But it's burdensome because you know you're going to be born again. And you're going to have to go through middle school again. You may have to wear braces again, but you'll be in a completely different... Anybody still have their braces on? Zach, all right. Can't you wait to get them off? Yes. All right. Eat a big caramel apple. What would what do you want to eat out of braces? Taffy, caramel apple, lollipop, whatever. Oh, there we go. Yeah. All right. So what you want to do is you want to focus on karma. Karma is work. All right. It's the things that you do. Good actions will have a good effect. All right. Bad actions will have a bad effect. And dharma is the rule book. Dharma says that in order to move higher up the ladder, you've got to obey the laws of your caste, of your gender, of your occupation. You may not like where you are, but why are you there? Any grace? Say that again, please. Because you got yourself there. You got yourself there. So if you don't like it, you can't cheat. You just got to suck it up and deal with it. 
And added to this comes a guy named Mahariva. And he creates the Jainish, Jainish sect of, of Hinduism, where he says, your soul, your Atman, attracts karmic matter. And this is where I use the Charles Dickens example of um, A Christmas Carol, when Jacob Marley comes clunking and clunking to see Ebenezer Scrooge. He's got all those chains, and he goes like, these are the chains that I formed in life, Ebenezer. All right, they are weighing me down. Bad karma attracts you like a, to a metal weight. Good karma weighs less. So you want to maximize the good and minimize the bad. This will not only give the poor people something to strive for, bless you, but it also justifies the social structure throughout India. Make sense? Yeah. All right, we'll move on. Boom. All right. Um, but because it's hard to conceptualize, um, Hinduism is kind of mono and polytheistic. We want to get to Brahman. You can be reborn as a god or a goddess, and that's great, but you still want to get to Brahman. But people need to conceptualize things, so they create all kinds of different um, visions for their gods and goddesses, from male to female, to an elephant, to an orangutan, all kinds of things. A lot of them are the same gods and goddesses. They just look different based on where you are in India. And this will be backed up by another Indian religion known as Buddhism. And Buddhism is thought up of the great sage Siddhartha Gautama, spoiled rich kid. Now, Gautama um, was crazy wealthy. He was so rich until he was 29 or 30, he never left his house. And one day, his son's, we'll call it soccer ball, rolls outside the gate, and he steps into the world, and there he sees a, beg a poor man begging, a sick man hacking up a lung across the street. Down the road, he sees a dead guy. In this blows his mind. He thought everybody lived like he did. Now I got a poor man, a sick man, a dying man, and it shakes him to the core. What is going on? So he leaves his wife and son, and he goes out into the desert for how many days? Forty, 40 days, all right? And your religious prophet, you got to go put in your 40 days. And out there, he comes up with the four noble truths. And he says the best way to achieve his version of Brahman is called Nirvana, one of Zach's favorite Seattle bands. All right. You want to achieve Nirvana. And there's four noble truths, four things that you have to understand. Um, basically, that all life is suffering. Right? And the the source of suffering is desire. We always want more stuff. So if you end desire, you can achieve Brahman, not in several lifetimes, but in one. To do that, you got to follow his eightfold path. Have right understanding. Know what is right and what is wrong. All right? Don't do the right thing, or don't do the popular thing, do the... Right thing. Right thought. Think good thoughts about others. Don't cuss bad drivers out in an internal monologue. I really need to work on that. Sometimes it affects my right speech because instead of just saying it internally, I've been known to verbalize it a time or two. All right, oops. All right, don't tell the story about Niagara Falls. Yeah, that's okay. All right. Right action. Once again, Thomas trips and falls, Alexi drops her stuff, stop and help them. Work for it. Nothing is going to come easy. In mindfulness, all right, pay attention to what you're doing. And what this does is it causes you to think about every single action you do, and you want them to be positive. And if you can do this, you can make it to Brahma. Now, it may not take just one lifetime but it may take two or three, which is a lot less than Hinduism. 
So in India, the people who really like this were the poor people because it gets them out of the caste, caste system. system. My caste system sucks, so I want to get the heck um, out of that. All right, we good with that one? We got a couple little slides here. And so you can know the true Buddha by the placement of their hands. All right, one on the ground, one up in the air, symbolizing heaven and earth. Four noble truths. All life is suffering. Number two, the origin of suffering is desire. If we end desire and suffering and follow the Eightfold Path, we're going to be fine. Know the truth. Don't say mean things. Meditate. Control your thoughts. Resist evil. Work for the good of others. You're going to be a-okay. So, all this is great. Right? Helps out China, it helps out India. Way over in Mesopotamia, we have those deeply polytheistic people God of the wind, God of the rain, God of the sun, God of the moon, God of the sand. And here is where we get something that will revolutionize the world. In Iran, there was a, a small localized religion known as Zoroastrianism. And Zoroaster had a concept that there were two competing forces, good and evil. And there was the god of good, Ahura Mazda, and the god of evil, a guy called Ahriman. You ever see the second Indiana Jones, the one in India, when the guy is ripping hearts out of people's chests? He's going, he, if you listen, he'll go, Ahriman, Ahriman is his thing. And the end of the world was going to happen when Ahura Mazda had to throw down with Ahriman, chained him up and throws him into a fiery pit. <coughs> Ahriman's followers would go with him, and Ahura Mazdas would inhabit a paradise. It's kind of a heaven and hell, God versus the devil look. But it was a dualistic religion. All right? There was a god of good and a god of bad. It's close, but Judaism focuses not on two gods, but on one single individual, Yahweh, or God. And God will form a covenant with the prophet Abraham who will leave the Persian Gulf, follow the Fertile Crescent, and wind up close to the Mediterranean coast in modern day Israel. And he says, Abraham, I am going to form my covenant with you. And a covenant is a contract. All right? Kate, I will promise I will do this for you as long as you help me out. Let's shake on it. Boom. That is our word. If either one of us breaks our word, that is not good. All right? We're not signing forms in triplicate. I will help out Kate if she will help out me. And God says, look, Abraham, I will make your descendants as numerical as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore if you guys believe in me and worship only me. Abraham's like, yeah, bro, you are my chosen people. This is going to be awesome. Um, won't get into the whole Isaac and Ishmael thing. We don't have time for that today. And this covenant has dual responsibilities. And the key to it is the Hebrews don't have 12, 15, 20 different gods. They got one guy who does it all. all right? One all-knowing, all-powerful, all-seeing God. And the Old Testament is a historical narrative of the Hebrew people. It is corroborated by other historical events, like, you know, the Hittites wrote this down, the Assyrians wrote that down, the Akkadians, the Babylonians. So people talk about it, but from different perspective or points of view for the DBQ. Ooh, we're rhyming now, like I'm rapping. So anyway, all right. I you guys like that? All right. I'm like, what are we singing? Where are we singing tomorrow, Sierra? We're singing at Cabaret. Cabaret, right? Is that what we're singing? Oh, I'm just going to watch Cabaret. We're having a Lucky concert tomorrow. Oh, Lucky concert. One of those things. 13, 14, 15, something like that, whatever. So anyhow. Um, and what is going to happen is the people are going to forget. They're going to need reminded. So God will send prophets, special messengers, that are going to make people snap to. Noah, 
David, God's chosen boy, Moses. Um, and all of these prophets will be the same not only in Judaism, but in Christianity and in Islam. And God is going to help the people out, all right? He's going to give you ten commandments. Guys, i got ten simple, stinking rules. If you just do them, I'm going to wrap up this package called the Torah. It's going to be the God book. I'm going to lay everything out. If you just do this, you're going to be good. I'm not only telling you what to do, I'm writing it down, and I'm showing you how to do it. And from this evolves two centerpieces of Judaic monotheism. Number one, God has a divine plan. He's got this all worked out. He knows what you're going to do before you do. And God is perfect justice and goodness. Pure justice and goodness. But sometimes that is a tough thing um, to do. And if you break the covenant, if you need a reminder, you got to be punished. Uh, punishment isn't to hurt you, it is to teach you what not to do. All right? Brett and the bros are playing lacrosse. A ball rolls out into the street without looking for cars. Brett runs out on the street, street and scoops up the ball. And what does his mom do? Brett, you can't play lacrosse for the next month. And she makes him sit in a chair and watch the other bros in the front yard practice. If they get run over with a car, well, at least it's not Brett. All right? And Brett, you may be sad, but you're not, Dead. You're not flat. You're not flat Brett Stanley out there being mailed across the country. All right? The punishment isn't mean just to harm you. It is to teach you and to keep you safe. And God will always take you back. All you have to do is say, hey man, I screwed up on that one, I'm sorry, can you please take me back? And the answer is yes. And this is revolutionary because in a sea of polytheism, the Hebrews will be abused for years because of their belief in one all-powerful, all-knowing God. But the Hebrews are not defined by a powerful dynasty or... You know, one single, like, she won the warlord, but by a shared faith and a practice of it. That will give birth to two other great religions in terms of number and spread globally around the world. So, that would be Moses. Here are the Ten Commandments. A uh, little thing. Okay, great. All right, good. All right. Let me see those pictures again. There it is. So, now we get over to Greece. Well, we might actually do this in less than an hour. Am I going too fast? Too bad we couldn't have done all year like this. We'd be like that. But there's no details. Is that okay? Great. Hannah's like, yeah, Dad, let's go over. I could really use an A&W right now. I'm not lying. God, that would be so good. Be the so anyway. All right. Greek thought. I have this guy named Thales. Thales is sitting down by a river, like thinking about stuff, baklava, heroes, you know, Will Percy and Annabeth make it out of Tartarus, we don't know. And he's watching this little river, you know, and he sees like some pebbles and rocks and the leaves and they kind of catch on the riverbank and this rock and he sees ever so slightly the river shift its course. He's like, wait a minute. I thought the gods could, I thought it was like a little river nymph, or Poseidon made that nonsense happen. But it didn't, it happened naturally. I physically saw the river change its course. And so Thales becomes the first philosopher, where he said the entire world is rational and knowable. If we sit and study it long enough, we can figure everything out. If we sit and stare at that DBQ long enough on exam day, we'll know what to write. It's a little more history you were. Jesse got it. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah. Anyway, so, <coughs> joking. So anyhow, um, he goes, if we apply natural laws to politics, 
we can solve the problems of our day, and we can form the world's perfect government. And this mantle is picked up with one of the big three um, philosophers. Number one is Socrates, also known in some circles as Socrates. Socrates is a city father in Athens, and he will fight in the Persian Wars, and at the end of the wars, he works with the great statesman Pericles to write the laws of the new government of Athens, this new um, direct democracy of Athens. And Socrates believed in a city-state. He said, if you live here, if you choose to live here, you agree to abide by our laws. That's what you have to do. But Socrates didn't like it. He's, that's because most average Joes are too stupid to know anything about the candidates. You can't make a decision. So if you don't know like what makes you tick, how can you make a decision for me? And so he um, teaches, he also, like Confucius, says, I'm not inventing this, I'm just transmitting tradition. And he becomes a teacher, because he wants the, the students to understand this. Like Confucius, he doesn't write anything down, but he comes up with a method of questioning, where you constantly ask questions, the things I write on your essays. What? Why? How? How are you going to do that? How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? When is it going to be completed? Who is going to help you with that? And he tells the students to ask this to their political leaders. Not to be rude or disrespectful, but if you tell me you're going to fix immigration and redo education and put America back to work and balance the budget and clean up the environment, okay, well, which one are you going to do first? How are you going to do it? How long is it going to take? Don't make me promises that you know you can keep. Problem is, politicians don't like that stuff. We say general blanket statements that sound good, and then, like, how are you going to do that? Well, my political advisor didn't, like, write that for me to, like, read to you. So, you know, now Bill Clinton could just, like, well, I'll just make some stuff up, and it'll sound really good. And they're like, oh, it might work. But most people aren't that good of a public speaker. They can't think on their feet. And so Socrates says, guys, just question them. Get to the core. And people don't like it. It's now known as the Socratic method. Lawyers use it. Um, salespeople sometimes use it. God awful teachers use it in some classes. And it winds up um, ang angering the people of Athens so much during the Peloponnesian War that they have Socrates put to death. And they try and trick him by saying, You can leave the city or drink the poison. And he says, I'll take the poison. And they're like, no, 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 you don't understand the law. He's like, oh, yeah, I do. I, I wrote the law. You're trying to discredit me by making me a hypocrite, so give me the hemlock, and uh, I'll chug it down, and this is how it's going um, to be. So anyway, all right. So here is good old Socrates. Hey, everybody, look at me. Count one, two, three, and I'll drink. And it was terrible. All right. And this gives rise to Plato. Plato is Socrates' best student. Um, Socrates is, or Plato is bitter after the death of Socrates. How could the city-state that Socrates loved kill him? And Plato wants to be a politician, and he's shattered. So my boy goes wandering around for ten years. He found some Greek peyote somewhere. And he starts writing down essays, allegory in a cave about the thirst for learning and education out of the darkness. Plato's Republic. Hey, Plato, what's the best form of government? Well, Plato, let me tell you. He writes 26 of these things as he looks for the world's most perfect government, and he supposedly finds it in the mythological city of Atlantis. We know this in Atlantis. Because Atlantis has the world's perfect government. They've got three social classes. They've got these 
philosopher kings who wear the color blue. And they would prefer a life of study, a life of contemplation, but they realize they're the only ones smart enough um, to govern things. So they, so they do it. In the second category, we have warriors. And these warriors are going to wear red. And they're going to protect everybody. And last but not least, we have farmers. And farmers wear green. And if you look at it, it's very similar to the, you know, uh, Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and Vyas in the caste system, right? Or the Estates General in the French um, Revolution. And what Plato comes up with it's very similar to your man Thomas Hobbes, where he says you should subordinate yourself to the will of the community. You should do not what you want, but what the community needs you to do. Right? So if you want to be a doctor and the community needs you to be a garbage man, well, be a, be a garbage man. You don't have a choice. Subordinate, do what's best for the community. And he says that gods don't matter. It's all human logic and reason. The gods really can't help you, so do your role in society. He then makes it eventually back to Athens, where he sets up a school that lasts for 900 years. Which brings us to my favorite, a guy called Aristotle. Aristotle was Plato's best student. He is also the the tutor of Alexander the Great. And Aristotle says, if you observe things long enough, their true nature will be revealed. So by 4.50 on a Friday afternoon, I'm observing that you guys are mostly tired. And Reed's like, I want to get the heck, even all the pleasant poppy is like, dude, shut up. And the bros are saying, oh. What's going on, Michael? So if you stare at things and observe them long enough, you will see people's true nature. The old saying is a tiger can't change his stripes, or the, the scorpion that convinces the fox to give him a ride across the river, and the fox says, well, if I let you on my back, you're going to sting me. And the scorpion says, no, I won't. Why would I do that? We would both drown. And the fox says, okay, makes sense. And the scorpion hops on halfway across the river. Scorpion pounds the fox, and the fox says, well, why did you do that? We're now both going to drown. And the scorpion says, well, it's just my, it's just my nature, all right? It's just what I'm supposed to do. So politicians can put on a good front. They can get out and kiss babies and shake hands and, and, and you know, um, smile and wave. And then you want to see them in their, in their dressing room or, or in the car. Before they're told what to say, are they cussing and swearing? Are they all oh, got to go talk to this stupid group of hillbillies in West Virginia? Or I got to go talk to these auto workers in Detroit or these lobster fishermen? Man, God, I hate these people. They smell like fish. Then they go out, hey, Maine, love lobster, lumps, fox. Oh my God, I love the smell of fish. And like, hey, wait a minute. Five minutes ago, you said we all suck. So you got to be observant. People's true nature will be revealed if you study them. And he says, when it comes to government, everybody must separate church and state. They should never be intertwined. So we can see Aristotle being used throughout Western Europe and the United States. When you get to the Eastern world, where we get the Byzantine Empire, Russia, different Islamic theocracies, it's different. But church and state must be separated. And he says the best type of government is the one that helps people in need. Your government should help you be successful. If you are a garbage man and you want to be a doctor, then the government should not let you. Help you if you can. But the best government cares for its people. It wants them to do it themselves. That you don't want them to do everything for you. Make social mobility a possibility. 
When people have a goal and they strive for it, they are not going to be angry. And what you must do, and this is the difficult part, is do what's best for the majority. You're never going to make everybody happy. So take a vote and majority wins. And those of you who lose, well, the only thing you can do is next time vote again. All right? Take what is best for the majority. And so Aristotle will close out by saying, that a government that wants to win, a government that wants to make policy and control the masses, must get in touch with the middle class. People who go to work every day, do their jobs and pay their taxes, he who controls the middle class is going to get power. And let's look at Julius Caesar and Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus and Mao Zedong and um, the San Colo in the French Revolution, the American colonists. If you get the average Joe on your side, you can pretty much do whatever. The top and the very bottom, eliminate those, you get the middle class, and you are going to be successful. So that is a quick look at all major religions and philosophies except Islam and Christianity, which we will pick up next week. Monday, how's Africa sound? Tuesday, Islam. Wednesday, Mesoamerica. After that, you guys tell me. Oh, then we'll do a day on trade routes. Indian Ocean, Transatlantic, and that'll be spit spot. Thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon, guys. Any questions? I know this was really fast, but I figured everybody wanted to bail. Yes, no, maybe. Thomas, can you hit stop for me? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, go enjoy some sunshiny weather.